If it comes on us spontaneously because we cannot control it, it's one thing. But this crying, this, this artificial wailing on that particular night, no. This is not from the Sunnah. This is not what Allah has called us to do. And the Prophet ﷺ said, "Man ذكر الله ففاضت عيناه من خشية الله حتى يصيب الأرض من دموعه لم يعذب يوم القيامة." One who remembers Allah and his or her eyes become filled with tears from the fear of Allah. So much so that the earth becomes wet from their tears. They will not be punished on the day of judgment. So many places in the Quran where Allah speaks about the true believers as being those who when Allah's verses are recited to them, recited to them, wajilat qulubuhum, their hearts become soft. This is among the things that we have to fight against. The hardness of the hearts. Where we are not moved to tears, where we don't feel in our hearts, our hearts don't quiver when Allah's name is mentioned. When the Quran is recited, we are not touched by it because we don't reflect on its meanings. As Allah says to us, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنِ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Will they not reflect on the meanings of the Qur'an? Or are their hearts sealed up? We are not reflecting on what Allah is saying. What we end up liking or preferring is the musical quality of the various reciters. We like Abdul Basit over, you know, Al Husri, or you like Minshawi over this one. Why? Because you like the beauty of their voices. So we have turned the Quranic recitation into a love like those who love the pop stars. This is something we need to reflect on. The Qur'an is supposed to move us not because of the beauty of the reciter's voice but because of what Allah is saying. This is why we need to know Arabic. We need to understand Allah's words as they were revealed. This is a duty on each and every Muslim to strive to learn Arabic to the degree that he or she is able. So when they hear Allah's words recited, it moves them. It touches their hearts. So in summary, there are seven. Seven shaded by the shade of Allah's throne on a day when there is no shade. Allah's throne is above His creation. And Allah is above His throne. He is beyond, above and beyond the creation. He is not mixed up inside of His creation. A very important concept. Because the belief that Allah is everywhere, inside of everything, this is the foundation of idolatry. Those who worship idols, who have philosophized their worship, will tell you, I am not worshipping this idol that you see. Ganesh, the elephant head god of the Hindus. I am not worshipping this object that you see. I am worshipping Brahman. The one god who is everywhere and who pervades everything. But at the time of my worship of this idol that you see, that God Brahman becomes concentrated in the idol. 
So I'm worshipping Brahman who is concentrated in the idol and not the idol. That is what they say. Those who have delved into the religion, who know the depths of it, this is their argument. Of course the common Hindu, if you ask him, he says, I worship Ganesh because whenever I worship him, my prayers are answered. Yeah, it's the idol. I don't have a problem with that. When I pray to Ganesh, what I pray for, my prayers are answered. That's his answer. He doesn't go into philosophy. But those who are more educated, the yogis, their sheikhs, the sheikhs will give you this explanation of the, the essence of their worship. So when one says Allah is everywhere, one supports their idolatry. One supports and promotes the idea that Allah is mixed up inside of His creation. And that leads ultimately to the claim that Allah and His creation are one. What is known as Wahdatil Wujud or Monism. This is an idea which was propagated by Ibn Arabi, Al Andalusi, from the 13th century who made this claim, everything, why are you worshipping anyone outside of yourself? Allah is in me, Allah is in you. There's no need to worship any external being. You can worship yourself. Because you are Allah. This idea is being promoted today by Harun Yahya. Harun Yahya, books coming out of Turkey, Evolution, Deceit, Perish Nations, etc., etc. If you go to the end of the book, the last chapter, his last chapter is exactly that. He says, those stupid people who think that Allah is above his creation, he ridicules those who believe that Allah is above his creation. Though when you go to Sahih Muslim, to the hadith of Muawiyah ibn al-Hakam, who had slapped his slave girl in the face because some of the sheep that she was guarding were stolen by a wolf. And he went to Prophet Muhammad to find out what he could do as atonement for this evil deed which he had done, slapping her in the face. And the Prophet told him to bring her. He asked, can I free her? He said, bring her. And when he brought her, he asked her, Ain Allah, where is Allah? And she said, Fis sama, above the heavens. And he said, Waman ana, and who am I? And she said, Anta Rasulullah, you are the messenger of Allah. And he turned to Muawiyah ibn al-Hakam and said to him, أَعْتِقْهَا فَإِنَّهَا مُؤْمِنَا Free her because she is a true believer. Prophet Muhammad ﷺ confirmed her statement that Allah is above the heavens as proof of the correctness of her faith. But Harun Yahya says, those stupid people who think that Allah is above the heavens. He goes on to say, Allah is everywhere. This world that you see is an illusion. And he brings the scientific arguments about why this world is an illusion. Because yes, on the molecular level, this table, this, this podium, which looks solid to us, it feels solid. If you go down on the molecular level, everything is moving. It is not solid. And if you look at colors, the colors that we see, are these colors real? Or is it the reflection of, of the light on these objects as it hits our retina and our brains uh, create a sense of color in our brain? So he argues, it is all an illusion. This world is a shadow world. This is, he's taken from Plato. Plato speaks about the shadow world. You know, ancient Greek philosophers. And he argues that this world is an illusion. And he quotes from Ibn Arabi and praises him as the Imam Rabbani when he was in fact a kafir, a disbeliever, a heretic.